So you guys, a big part of SAT and PSAT kind of problems is that they don't tell you a category. You're not in a unit on those. And so identifying what kind of problem you're dealing with is really, really important. Um, it's going to range from just linear algebra, which is what this one is, to nonlinear algebra. So things like our last warm-up where you solved for, you had a quadratic equation to solve. <clears throat> it will have some geometry. It's like 15% or so, some statistic probability kind of stuff. So, you know, you might have this problem, which is linear algebra, following a probability question, and you have, your brain has to switch back and forth, which makes it hard, right? So that's why I'm trying to talk to you about noticing details that help cue you to what kind of problem. Like the fact that we have two totals, so total of points and total puzzles. So I would start, since totals usually follow an, equi an e equal sign, I would start by writing two different totals. Again, one is a puzzle total, puzzles, and one is points. Okay? Once you have that, you kind of need to know how do you get the total puzzles and start making equations out of it, right? So, how do you get a total of 50 puzzles? And I'm not asking for specific numbers yet, just what are you doing to get a total puzzle count? Yeah? Adding the amount of puzzles that you did? Yeah, you're just counting up how many puzzles you did. And in this problem, we have two types. We have easy and hard. So, however many of each we did, that's our total, right? I would really recommend not using X's and Y's because they get lost. So I would use E and H. Easy plus hard equals 50. Then it becomes very easy to keep track of things. So easy puzzles, <coughs> excuse me, plus hard puzzles is a total of 50. Okay, looking at the next one, how do we get our points? For doing the whole thing at all, how do we get points? Oh, yeah. And then 30 times. Okay, so we get 30 points for each easy and 60 points for each hard. Those total points have to add up to 1950. <coughs> and guys, once you're here, it's downhill. Like, that's definitely the hardest part of this problem is getting that written out. Because it doesn't give you a direction. You're not in a linear algebra unit right now. So you're not in the mode of thinking, hey, I've got to write equations. All of that adds up to this part being the hardest. From here, though, it's pretty easy to solve, or at least should be. You have the option to do substitution, where you could maybe... Um, the question asks about hard puzzles, so don't eliminate or don't get rid of H. That's the one you want to keep. So you could maybe rewrite that first equation as 50 minus H for E, and then take that and substitute it right there. You could do it that way. And now you're, you only have one variable, which is H. It would look like this. 30 times 50 minus H plus 60H equals 1950. And we've solved a whole, whole bunch of these equations, even in geometry class. Okay, that's one option. What's another option? That, that method is called substitution, but that's not the only way to do this. Well, it's a system either way. Like, that is our system. The other method is called elimination. We could eliminate E or eliminate H. By, but can I just add them and eliminate one of them right now? What do you need to do first? So this is substitution. I'm going to let you think. What do I need to do first before I can eliminate Again, you don't need to do both of these methods, just one of them. Okay, we need to have one of these two variables have the same coefficient as the other equation. 
And I already said you shouldn't get rid of H because you're solving for H for the problem. So let's get rid of E, which means I need to multiply this first equation by 30 so it matches the other equation. Everybody remember doing this? Okay. So we get 30E plus 30H equals 1500 when we multiply all the way across. How are we going to get rid of these? Do we add or subtract? Subtract. Subtract. Okay, so the E's are gone. 60 minus 30 is 30. 1950 minus 1500 is 450. And that's really easy to solve. Just divide by 30. And now we know H is 15. And that's all this one asks for. So B. You, you would get the same thing if you did this. You'd get, here's your 1500 minus 30h plus 60h, subtract your 1500, it's exactly the same result. It's huh? It's more like common sense, I think. Which one? You get the answer. Okay. In this case, you could plug in, what, you have 10, 15, 25, and 35, you could plug those in for h. You don't know what the other variable is, but you could plug that one in. It might get you a little closer, right? but it's slow to do it that way. How many of you got B? And without guessing. Okay? So about half. Tell us how you did it. Uh, well, I kind of just used my brain, I guess you'd say. Like, so well, I that's just, a good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, no, I just added, um, so I found out what the total point was, right? It was that. So I just divided it in half to 50, and I realized that was way too many hard puzzles. So I divided it by three, Realized that was still not as high, so I divided it by, or yeah, I divided by three. So it gave me like 12.5 for it, and I was like, that sounds closer, so I just rounded up to 15 and called it good. So, okay. and it works. So. Sometimes that works out. Yeah. It's kind that of a, the, the technical word for that is the iterative approach, so iterations of answers, meaning like trial and error. So good. Ready to think through it. Any questions on it? All right. Could you have used a calculator to help you solve faster? Any thoughts? I would say yes, but you have to get to this point before you can. Okay? If you get to this point, then you probably, if you're using your calculator, want to call these x and y. Then you could graph them, like get h by itself and graph it, and then you could look for the point of intersection. I don't really think that's faster, honestly, not in this case, but it might help you if you're struggling with the solving part. All right, so grab the sheet from last time, please. So number nine was kind of a theoretical question, but really kind of helped you to think through it, hopefully. We haven't talked about this, this uh, vocab term sample space. What it means it's, it's kind of a weird description, but it means something easy. It's the set of all of our possible outcomes. So when you roll a standard number cube, what is your sample space? It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, right? Those are your possible outcomes is 1 through 6. And it says in this case, um, it's not specific to number cube, but it's saying it's like that in that everything is equally likely and mutually exclusive. So anytime you have one of these kind of vague theoretical problems, maybe link it to something that you do know, like rolling a die. So what's the probability of rolling a 1 on a regular die? 1 6, right? So, and I'm, I'm not going to write this all out. You'll see where it's going pretty quick. Is a die... Are all options or all outcomes equally likely on a die? Yes. Are they mutually exclusive? Meaning, can a number be 6 and a 2 at the same time? No. Nope. So they are mutually exclusive. So that's this case, right? It's an example of this case. What's the probability of rolling a 2? Okay. 3, etc. What are those going to add up to? That's what that's asking. What will those add up to? If I continue on down to the 6, so what's 1 6 plus 1 6, etc.? What are those added to? 
They don't have six. One six plus one six plus one six plus one six. Doesn't add up to six, but does add up to what? One. Six six, maybe that's what you're saying. So basically, it's a hundred percent. Because really what this question is saying is if all outcomes are equally likely and you can't be both, the probability that's, that one of them happens is 100%. Okay? 10. Where's the error in 10? This person, I can't remember if it's a girl. Who cares? Yeah, Daniel. 12 out of 400, that's the chess club. 20 out of 400, that's the math club. So she just added her probabilities and said you have an 8% chance. What's wrong with that? Emma. Awesome. She really did need to... I'm going to scribble that out. She really did need to subtract the 6 out of 400 that are in both. So basically she double counted those 6 students, right? Threw off the probability just a little bit. Awesome. Good job. Okay, next one was 16, I think. Okay, so you're throwing a disc with an equally likely chance of landing anywhere in that rectangle. Why does it have to say equally likely? Like if I blew up this picture and gave somebody a disc, why does it say that in the problem? Because then it wouldn't be like random because they could just aim it. Yeah, if you're aiming, you're probably going to hit the target more than not, right? So it, it's kind of a way around that issue. Anyway, this is an area problem like we talked about on Tuesday. So what's the area of the whole rectangle? It's 2,000. And I'm not going to worry about units right now. What's the area of the triangle? Half that in this case, because it's one half base times height, so it's a thousand. So, what is the probability that the disc goes on the red triangle? Fifty percent, or one out of two, right? Good. Why did it say um, largest triangle? Why did it say that? Yeah, there are three triangles. And sometimes your eye doesn't pick that up, but there are three triangles actually on there. All right, next. 25 students in a class. Eight are shorter than 65. So eight are, I'm just going to make this more visual. Eight are less than 65. Ten. Ten are greater than 69. So number 17, what's the probability that a student is less than 65 or greater than 69? What do you need to ask first? Yeah, we need to know if those are mutually exclusive. Well, can you be both? Nope. So in this case, it's just adding them up. So 8 out of 25 plus 10 out of 25, which is 8. <coughs> Excuse me, 18 out of 25. And you can't reduce that, so you can, it's fine to just leave it. Number 18, uh, probability that it's greater than or equal to 65. What are we missing for this one? Do you see? Go ahead, Sophie. Good. So the heights between 65 to 69, how many students fall in there? Seven. Seven. Good job. Okay, so in this case, you can't be both um, or equal to 65. The way it's worded, you can't be both. So we just add 7 plus 10 out of 25. Okay. Guys, what's different about 19, and what makes you think I didn't assign that one? Why 
How do you suppose I chose to not sign that one? It has, and. it has the word and instead of or. And so today's our job is to figure out, at least start figuring out what do we do with and probabilities. Okay? We're not going to get all the way through it because it goes deep, but it starts, we start with it. Uh, on this one, it's like the one above on number 16, only this time we have this overlapping spot that we have to take off. So basically our, our whole area is 600, that's the total, and our two circles are 25 pi plus 25 pi, oops, minus 30. So 25 pi and 25 pi is the two areas of the circles, and pi button or 3.14, either one. We have two of those, and then we take off 30, and we get 127 out of 600. How'd that one go? Any questions on that? That Just that problem? Does everybody see why we took the 30 off? Okay. Percentage-wise, um, just hit divided by 600, 21.2. It says nearest percent, so 21%. Cool. Thank you. All right, so that's mutually exclusive, non-mutually exclusive probability. Give me a fist to five on that one. Fist to five. Okay. Guys, probability can be a pain. I'll just be honest. It's like you think you, you're going down the right track and then you didn't consider something and it throws the whole thing off and it's frustrating. So just know, you, as we get more into this, you really got to make sure you're studying and keeping on top of it because it will bite you. It bites me. Like when I'm keying stuff, I get frustrated because it's just sometimes not what you expect. Okay? And the way to combat that is to be super familiar with it. Make sense? <coughs> um, I'd like to talk about this and probability for a little while, and then maybe we'll have time to probably we'll have time to work on those problems in the it's in they're gonna be in the packet. So have your notes ready, and I'm gonna jump over here real quick. So let's take this slide kind of just piece by piece. So think of a jar or a bag. You know, you've probably read problems like this before, but some kind of container that has 12 green marbles and 10 violet ones. Huh? Eight violet. What did I say? Thank you. That's an eight. If you choose a marble at random, what is the probability? Let's just break this down. What's the probability that it's purple or violet? I'll use a B. 8 out of 20, out of 20 right? So again, going, and you don't need to flip here. I'm going to do it for you. But going back to your notes, that front page, just basic calculations, it's number of desired out of the total. So in this case, we had, sorry. 8 purples and out of 20 total. And if we reduce this, what goes into both? Okay, so 4 goes into both. All right, and then separately, what's the probability of green? Uh, let's see, 4, so 3, this, there we go. All right, well... What happens if I don't put the marble back on the second draw? What changes? <coughs> so I pull one out. These are the probabilities of getting a 
green or a purple, if I put it back in. So this word replace is important. And you'll hear it in probability world as with replacement. That's how we say it in the, in the field of probability. So what happens if I don't replace it, though? Yeah? The total is less. The total is less. Good. Yeah, the chance of getting, well, it could lessen or it could grow. Depends on what you drew, right? So one of these cases we call independent, and the other is dependent, okay? So if I pull out a purple, violet, if I pull out a violet marble, what is different about the next draw if I don't put it back? Okay? So I now have 19 marbles in the bag, right? So if I pulled out a violet one, does my probability of the green increase or decrease? It increases, right? Because there's still 12 greens, but now I have one less to pick from. So it actually grows. My probability of the violet says what? There's one less of those in there. So it depends what I do. As soon as you say it depends, it's no longer independent. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay? So, we'll go write this definition, but let's read it first. Two events, remember events are like marble drawing. They're independent if and only if the occurrence of one does not affect the probability of the other. So, if I take that marble and keep it, I have now created a situation where it depends... So that is no longer de independent. So you guys, we're going to get... That's not yours. We're going to get into some pretty deep stuff with this, at least probably based on what you're used to. So do take good notes. And I would probably break it down here <coughs> and say and probability. And go up here to our notes from last time. Can get all the way. Why isn't it going all the way? There we go. And bunch this together as the or case. Okay? So mutually exclusive, non mutually exclusive, those are the or case probabilities. Dependent and independent are the and case. So make sure you can see that good. So independent events, the occurrence of one event does not affect the probability of the other. Guys, you can't, sometimes you can just, you just know they're independent, but don't trust your gut. What do I mean by that? I'll give you an example in a second.
flipping a coin, rolling a die. Are those dependent or independent? Does me flipping a coin and getting tails affect what I roll? No. So that one, yeah, you can use your gut. It's definitely independent. Okay? Does being male or female impact using Android or Apple? Those could be dependent. They could maybe be independent. We don't know, right? We need to do a test. And I'll show you that. We won't get to that until next week. But those are two things that could maybe have a relationship where one impacts the other, but we don't actually know that until we manage some numbers. So, again, don't always use your gut. Sometimes you think it's independent when it's not. And that's one of the areas where probability can get you. Okay. Okay. Skip through that. <coughs> Let's go to this one. If you do, you want a minute to write it down, or do you want to just do it with me? Okay. All right. So Alex can't decide which shirt to wear today, so she chooses one at random. These are her shirts. Okay. So she has four shirts to choose from, and um, then she's talking about the probability of rain today is 40% or two-fifths. So seemingly unrelated, right? What you choose to wear and rain probability. So what is the probability that Alex chooses a yellow shirt and it does not rain? Okay, number one, are these events independent? So I'm going to start having this on our slides because we need to ask about these two things. Not for every problem, but just keep it in mind. Are those independent? As far as we know, are they independent? Yeah, like probably she may not even look out the window when she picks her outfit, right? Just get dressed and then leave. So, yes, we'll assume that these are independent. I'm not going to write the word assume, actually. Let's just say they are. They are independent. So how do you think we find the probability if they are independent? We have said in the past, which I think was Tuesday, or probability increases your probability and probability decreases your probability. <laughs> so the probability of wearing a yellow shirt is what? Based on the picture. It's two out of four or one half. What's the probability that it will not rain? Remember the symbol for not is a tilde. Is three-fifths. Okay? So I'm going to write these two as P of yellow and, and not rain. Remember to write your probability notation anytime you're doing these problems. And I'm going to write the two numbers... But what do we do with them? How can you make fractions decrease the value instead of increase? Because remember, all our, all our probabilities have to be less than 1. So this rule will apply. In the OR probability, what did we stick in between there? If this said OR, what would we stick in between there? The plus. And that would make the probability grow. We said AND probability decreases it, so what can I stick in there? Okay? If you just say subtraction, remember that could make, like in this case, that would be zero. Or it would be less than zero, it would be negative. Does that make sense? So we can't do a subtraction, so what's left? Division or multiplication. And so it turns out that we're going to multiply these probabilities. Okay? When they're independent, we can just straight multiply. So this will become, how do we multiply fractions? Just straight across numerator and denominator. So this becomes 3 tenths or 30% if we want a percent. So she has a 30% chance of wearing a yellow shirt and it not raining at the same time. Make sense? Okay, let's do the second one. It's a little deeper. Or do you guys want to try it on your own? I kind of would like it if you did. You want to try it? Okay, before you do, let's go add this little formula to your notes. Straight under independent events. 
if they're independent. And man, it's so important to, to know that. Then the probability of A and B is just their product. So just multiply them. Okay? If they're independent, then and probability is just multiplying. If they're not independent, it gets a little hairy. So we'll have to tackle that another day. So same situation, same clothes, etc. So what's the probability that Alex chooses a yellow shirt and it does not rain? That's the one we just did. Okay, just know that we already have that one done. But we're adding this. Or Alex chooses a green shirt and it rains. So now we need to combine probabilities. But you still need to go figure out this green one. Right? The green and rain. Go figure it out first. Are you guys ready for that? Want to give it a shot? Okay. I'll give you a couple minutes. 